We're talking about ham radio coax for beginners today and uh, we're going to talk about different types of coax, different questions that you may have. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. How uh, we've, yeah, it, co <laughs> coax is a wonderful topic, isn't it, uh, to, to discuss. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, it's... It does take a little bit of time though to to work out what's going on as you're a, as you're a beginner though like cuz if you just type in ham radio coax into Google you get heaps of different results and different model numbers and specifications sure. and you don't know what it all means do you so Well I see I think most people don't even get that far right so people go to mm. eBay and they type in coaxial cable mm. and you know the people on eBay yeah Amazon all these places are just the worst because they are, they're like, this was the best ham radio cable that you can possibly get. And it's like RG 58, um, yeah. you know, just t terrible cable. And to, it, it, I, I've got some sitting right here that I, when I bought it, I had no idea. I was just like, Oh, $20 for 25 feet. Mm. You know, I, I thought I was getting hooked up and I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably one recommendation is not to buy coax off of eBay <laughs> without actually checking what it is first. Right. Um, there are, there are some, there are some, um, specs written on cable that you can pretty much trust that it is good cable most of the time, but we'll we can we can go into that a little bit later on. But um, but yeah, lots of stuff out there. Um, in the same similar vein, connectors are the same too. Not all the connectors are the same. Some are real cheap, cheap, right. you know, cheap crap that you don't really want. Um, they'll fall to bits on you. So, um, I guess we can sort of touch on that a little bit too. But um, thank you everyone for watching this morning. Um, so I guess the first thing that we could start off with is probably the most common question is, is well, what coax do you use? So for a majority of hams over in the US, a lot of you guys probably start out as your technician license. So you don't have, sure. you've got one HF band, I think 10 meters, that's correct. Um, so it's mainly VHF and above. So what's what sort of... What do you need to look out for when you're sort of operating at those higher frequencies? So, with hunt, so yeah. two meters, seventy centimeters, those sort of frequencies. Well, the the ones that you really need to look out for are loss in cables. So, like, um, you know, I have this buddy Stan, and uh, I, I told the story a long time ago where he had set up this antenna that he got off of like Alibaba or something like that. You know, it's not not really the best antenna, and he was telling me it was near one to one. SWR and he was really happy yep. with that and he I don't remember how much it was, it was like 75 feet of coaxial cable and uh so I went over there and I said look let's take the meter and let's go test the antenna at the feed point and we did mm. like right at the antenna and it was a little over one and a half to one mm. and uh he was like look the meter doesn't lie what are you talking about why does it do this stuff and you know I just had to explain to him that the 100 watts that, or 50 watts that he was transmitting from his station you know, only like 20 of that, the like half was getting, getting, actually getting out because the, you have ohmic resistance in the coaxial cable. It, like everything reacts to frequency, right? And when you get in higher frequency, cheaper cable will have more ohmic loss in it than, than better cable. And uh, what happens is that only a little bit of your signal makes it to the antenna, but when it reflects because of your SWR, you get lost the other direction back. And so when it comes back, it's going to be like, oh, there's not, there's no, there's no loss no, on this antenna. So it gives you, it gives you a fake SWR. So that's, your SWR mm. is fake. Mm. And uh, that's, it doesn't, won't hurt your radio, but you really get so low power out that it can be an aggravating um, experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Coax can mask your, your real SWR and, and effectively your efficiency of what's radiating out of your antenna. And in actual fact, it's probably, <laughs> I was going to cover that actually a little bit later on in the show, but now that you mention it now, we may as well. Um, if you if you are um, building antennas and you want to measure what the feed point SWR is of the antenna so that you take effectively the coax out of the equation, you can measure an electrical half wavelength of coax at the frequency that your antenna is at. So say it's on 20 meters, you can measure an electrical half wavelength and we can discuss what the difference is between a physical and an electrical half wavelength is. Um, and if you use a piece of coax that is that long, then the feed point impedance, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the feed point uh, impedance will be the same as at the other end of the, the, the coax and you won't get any sort of transformations or any sort of impedance mismatching happening there. So um, that's a good little tip. I, I do that a lot when I build VHF antennas, um, yeah. two, two meter antennas. 
I, I do multiple half wavelengths because it's very hard. You can't you can't get your your analyzer or whatever and stick it right on the feed point because you know you might have your antenna up high sure. or you, you're testing it you know um, in a weird configuration. So you still need to connect the coax somehow, but. Um, yeah, Patrick was making a really good point. He says what you can do is you can calibrate out the, the length of the coax. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that's, you know, it's complex to do that, right? Like, so a lot of times people don't do that. And a lot of things that people have is rig experts, right? And I don't necessarily yeah. have a problem with the rig experts. Um, but I've, I don't think I've ever seen a video of somebody doing a calibration of a rig expert when they're testing an antenna. Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. nano VNA, obviously, it's a common common procedure. You can do it, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you've got sort of the older style MFJs as well, you can't do that as well. Um, but yeah, you can you can definitely do that to um, effectively disconnect that coax from um, masking any sort of uh, variations that you might have. So, but that's for that's yeah. for tuning antennas. Yeah, well, you're talking about the wavelength in relationship to the frequency and doing it on two meters. Where it gets tricky is that uh, everybody wants multi-band antennas. Right in, in HF, and so, well, it's a handy handy thing. It's 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 different in, in the HF in the HF space if you have like a NFET half wave, for example. Mm, mm, yeah, so um, we we can touch on that a little bit more because that's sort of going to be a little bit more deeper in in discussion. But coax um, is for for ham radio coax. The stuff that you want to look for is fifty ohms. So uh, the 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 radio is fifty ohms. The antenna that you're tuning is fifty ohms. So you want to use the uh, coax in between to be fifty ohms as well. Uh, we were talking backstage a little bit about uh, right. um, seventy five ohms, weren't we? About how uh, how some some might be tempted to use some some seventy five ohm coax, but the problem with using that is that you have a mismatch already between the two. Um, a, a, apart from that, you might not be able to find connectors for 75 ohms very easily. But, uh, but yeah, uh, 75 is not really the, the stuff that you want to be using. Well, the, you know, you, you hear about it all the time where somebody's like, I got a spool of that for $17 at the Goodwill. And they, they want to use that wire. Um, to your point, the connectors are an issue sometimes. Mm. But also there's power requirements around coax too, right? And so you could get a coax that can't handle the power output that you're that you're looking mm. to use if you start getting goofy uh like tv video cable coax and stuff mm. but that doesn't mean to say that you can't use 75 ohms because in some cases right. you can because if you're doing um matching of an antenna sometimes you need an impedance transformation because not all antennas sometimes come out at 50 ohms you might have you know uh, a, a weird impedance which you need to transform down or or transform up or whatever yeah. the case is so you can use a piece of 75 ohm coax in the feed line to be able to do that transformation and that's a lot of this is sort of in antenna books um the ARRL handbook goes into a lot of um, transmission um line uh, uh mismatch and uh, not mismatch um matching so yeah. uh so yeah that that it is sometimes still used but um uh, yeah, the the seventy five ohm. Actually, Todd makes a good point here, talking about um, seventy five ohm BNC connector coax. Yeah, if you're having a look on Amazon and you just see a roll yeah. of coax with some BNCs, you would you would think that it could be fifty ohms, but BNC is also used in the television industry, which is seventy five yep. ohms. So, yeah, you that's don't AV want that nerd sort of stuff. A AV nerd cable, not ham radio nerd cable, right? Mm. Mm. Well, mm. well, um. So it, you make an interesting point that like a, a resonant dipole with a half wavelength above perfect ground, right, which never exists, um, is around 74 ohms. So a lot of times folks will say, well, my dipole is really at 74 and I use 74, co 75 coax. And um, there are, like you mentioned, there are applications. Like I, I, I read a lot about antennas that folks used to use like in the olden days. Um, and a common practice was to do... Uh, quarter wave vertical for like 40 meters and you would tune it to multiple bands and uh so you would get some goofy impedance and these guys build these what they were doing is building these matchbox or matching units um mm. which is basically what we would call an un, -un but um for goofy goofy impedance matching out at the antenna so right at the where the antenna feeds is where they would put these matchboxes um most of the hams if not all of the hams that i talked to don't don't do that we generally uh in the appliance operator era we we do our matching with a tuner right out of the back of the back of the radio, right? Yep. 
Yep. And and all that's really doing is just making a radio happy, seeing the seeing yeah. a, a low SWR, but your efficiency is down because you're just wasting wasting power. Uh, Max uh, says. Uh, howdy Hayden and Ape studying for my foundation license in Australia this year thanks to your content in the middle of playing out my first VHF station really appreciate your work good stuff Max yeah good luck on it that's a good segue that moves us back to the first VHF station so the first thing you want to look at for um, for coax is 50 ohms but then Mm. the next thing that you probably want to be looking at is loss of the cable so uh, cable loss is measured in decibels so dB um, 3 dB is half your power lost. So right. if you think about how long your coax needs to be from your, where your radio is operating in your shack to where the antenna is at the other end, you need a physical length of cable. So once you work out that, say you've got 10 metres of cable that you need, you'll look at specifications of different cable and you'll see how much loss there is per, I think it's usually 100 foot or 100 metres if you're if you're metric. Um Right. And then you can sort of divide that down and work out how much loss you're going to get over the the amount of um, uh, cable that you need because uh, with loss, the power coming out of your radio will be lost at the other end of the antenna. So if you had 3 dB of loss, you've lost half your power. You'll have 50 watts at the other end. And it's the same with receive too. You'll lose it on receive as well because you don't you – don't, uh, yeah, you don't get um, – you don't get anything for free. You're gonna lose. You're gonna lose something somewhere. So, well, the thing is, is like um, RG8X is about a little over four dB of loss um, mm. over 100 feet at two meters. So in the mm. two meter band. So if you if you cut that in half, that's two dB. I mean, that's a significant chunk of your signal, right? If you talk mm. three dB in half, you're probably somewhere around 60 percent of your power getting out. Um, mm. And that's not counting any impedance mismatch you have at the antenna end, um, mm. and it, it 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 adds up fast. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it is also a general thing too that as you start to get to lower loss cable, it'll generally be thicker, heavier, and also yeah. more expensive. So there is a little bit of a balance on where you place your antenna. Um, generally, when I'm setting up antennas for the first time. I'll look and see where's the best place for the antenna in relation to my shack or relation to where my, I'm going to be operating because I want the shortest distance possible so that I don't have to run a massive long coax run. Um, and if that's not always possible, then you know if, if I can minimize that distance of that coax um, that I'm running, uh, then you can choose what cable that you're going to, to pick. So the common first cable that a lot of people look to is rg58 so i've got a i've got a spool of spool of that here which is that thin stuff yeah look at this yeah. this is this is pre- premium coaxial cable i've got some 58 um, right here yeah and this here is not really um appropriate for vhf and above um if you have a super short run so like i don't know less than what would you say, 10 feet or something like that yeah. maybe? I think this but, is like 15 feet right here. But Yeah, but anything anything longer than that, you're going to get way too much loss um, on, on VHF and UHF, especially UHF, yes. Um, uh, in the, the exception being in a vehicle, if you're installing a radio in a vehicle, uh, because of the flexibility of this cable and because it's usually a very, very short run to the antenna anyway, um, then it's then it's okay, but... Um, yeah, I wouldn't use this. Um, I wouldn't use this. For, it's very for popular with uh, CB radio enthusiasts because mm-hmm. of the flexibility that you mentioned for running in the car and mm. the other one. And you t- typically short short feed, like you said, um, and it's inexpensive. And the losses are less at ten meters than they are at two meters. Mm. Um, so that's actually how I have it. I, I actually, I'm pretty sure that piece was for a CB installation years ago. Mm. Um, well, that piece that you just had, if you hold that up again. Uh, T.O. actually, hello T.O. in the chat, by the way. Um, he's talking about jumpers. So that there, I think you had a connector on the other end. Yeah, so that's a that's a jumper basically to be used in the shack, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So well, what I use for jumpers in the shack are, I think I got one around here. Here. This is um, RG8X. 
Mm. And this is like about an eight foot piece. It might, might be 10 feet or 12 feet or something like that. This is a little bit thicker, a little bit less, a little bit less lossy. Um, but I use RG eight X mostly. Like I've got a couple of like three foot jumpers that I use between for HF between my radio and the tuner, stuff like that. And because you've got such a short piece in the shack and that stuff, I'm just having a look here at the specifications now because I don't have it all off, off by heart. Um, but, uh, having such a short piece in the shack is not too much of a problem with with that because it's you know relatively short so well some things can get difficult you were talking about some cable gets bigger and fatter and porkier and less flexible is mm. people will make jumpers out of lmr 400 which is very low loss premium cable but mm. it's like this it's as big as round as a nickel you know what i mean mm. and uh I don't know if you have nickels down there in tasmania but <laughs> dollars <laughs> but, yeah yeah but, but uh um you know, the thing is, is that you might hook it up to your to your equipment, like an SWR meter or a tuner or something like that, and the cable is so inflexible that your meter won't sit flat. Yeah, 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 that's that's for sure. And talking about the breakdown of coax, so the you've got the main part, so you've got the center conductor, which is the wire in the center of the cable. That's surrounded generally by some, uh, some material called dielectric, which mm -hmm. is basically... Um, insulates that center conductor from the outer, which is a, a, an outer conductor, which is a shield, shield of the cable. Mm -hmm. And then you've got an outer jacket, which is um, just the plastic on the outside like to PVC. sort of protect it. Yeah. And LMR 400, which is the cable that you just mentioned, and I'll bring up this, uh, this on DX Engineering's website because it's convenient. You'll see that not all cable is the same. This particular cable um, of... LMR 400, which is here, that's actually got a solid copper inner conductor, which um, right. means it's not as flexible as some of these other cables that have a stranded one. So, um, yeah, if you're using jumpers in the in the shack, you want it to be as flexible as possible because you're going to be moving it around and you don't want it to break and you don't want it to be stiff and all that sort of thing. So... Yeah, I ordered a piece of cable from Mezzi and Poloni that was this 13, I think it was, this, this Ultraflex 13. That stuff? And, well, similar to that. Yeah, mine's not way. white, though. But, man, yep. that stuff is big around cable. Mm. And uh, it was expensive. And it only got, like, 12 feet. And the thing that really got me, here's another piece here. This this isn't... Um, this isn't that's this isn't the same one, but look at the size of these connectors that they have on here. I couldn't believe the quality of the connectors. Yeah. This is all this is Ultraflex seven. Um, and uh, I got let this me, for let me let me just open up my box. <laughs> um. <laughs> but um, this yeah. this one piece I have here, I wouldn't consider it a jumper, even though it's short. It goes from the window to my radio. Yeah, those things look fantastic. Yeah, and and. Actually, while we're talking about messy and plain, um, the cable, this is the stuff that I just got out of the box here, which is, this is the 10 millimeter stuff. This is actually um, FT, this is called um, Hyperflex 10, but it's called Sahara FT8. This is supposed to be used for- um, Digital modes. Digital modes, yeah, for when um, it gets hot, when cable, because if, if, the, if the cable gets hot at the radio end, generally, um, because you're running a lot of power, then the characteristics of the cable can change. Um, mm -hmm. The same too as if you're operating in in hot environments outside. So it's white to reduce the UV um, or sun heating retention because black because black generally heats up a lot to, uh, <coughs> heats up a lot more than than white. Um, but this is also flexible, so you can use this for jumpers in the shack as well. And I think um, the RG8X is similar similar to to compare mm -hmm. it to as well. Um, but, uh, going back to this, this diagram here from DX engineering, we talked about the attenuation. There's the loss. Loss also changes depending on frequency too. Mm -hmm. So something that might be low loss at say five megahertz for, or what's that? That's your 60 meter band, isn't it? Yeah. Um, might be different to 150 megahertz and then conventionally too, the, the power rating goes down too. So not all cable can't handle super high power levels. So that's DXE58AU, which is essentially a clone of RG58. 
58 AU, right? Mm, mm. Yep. Um, yeah, I couldn't. I just brought this up when I just Googled it. But RG58, and if we're talking about quality coax, um, if you have a look at this, there's a spec called MIL, MIL, military specification. Mm. Usually if it has that written on the coax, that you know that it's, it's pretty fake. good quality. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that's to be honest, you do have to be careful with that sometimes because they might just write that on the coax just to make it look like that it is. But there are yeah. um, military specifications, which is usually the good coax. Just these guys, um, extreme. <laughs> this extreme. is extreme. <laughs> yeah, extreme consumer products. This is uh, 100 feet of um, RG8X. And uh, I think I paid like seventy dollars for this, and yeah. um, the same the same piece is now one twenty or one thirty. It's it's almost doubled in price. Yeah. Um, I know it's not the best cable in the world, but uh, it, I, I have a hundred foot run outside, and I bought a second one because I figured my hundred foot run would get damaged, and it has. Um, so I either got to get some connectors and some some splicers and all that stuff, and and do some surgery, or I just run that new cable out there. I bought two it when I got it. So it would have a spare, but at the time I looked at 100 feet, what my loss was going to be, how I was operating, and I was like, I, I, it 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 doesn't worry me. Mm. And so, like I talked to guys who will have like a, um, a, a Redivis or re, or a Radio Oddity mobile, and I'm not making fun of those. I've got them myself, and and then they'll want to buy LMR 400. I'm like, you're going to spend more on your cable than you did on your radio. Mm. And so sometimes it's, you can be penny wise and pound foolish if that makes sense. <clears throat> Maybe it doesn't, but I, I would be considered. I gotta get a sip of water or something. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um. <clears throat> but um, you know, I just would put things into perspective. That's all. Yeah. Uh, just saying thank you to uh, Jim FEP. Uh, very legit with that accent. I hope it sounds fantastic. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when you mentioned about uh, what is it RG seventy five and uh, and I got that spool of wire, I just went straight into that southern accent for some reason. But I try <laughs> I try not to do that too much. Um, Forty five Auto says fl that I was flexing hard with that MMP coax. Yeah, the thing is, is it's um it's good stuff though. Um, I've just uh you know got that they've sent me some stuff. Um you know, recently that I've got to do a video on. Um, but you mentioned the connectors on these. This is this is sort of that high quality connector stuff. Um Yeah. It's not like the cheap nickel connectors that you get off eBay or anything like that. So um and they do they do jumpers as well so you can actually pick what lengths that you want and they'll pre make them if you want to. Um nice. but yeah most of this most of this cable that they have is is flexible. It's ultra flexible stuff and um multiple stranded center conductor um and and you know really good shielding on the outside of the cable so it's pretty good stuff well the, um you talk about shielding some like the cheaper cable isn't uv protected right so if you run it outside yeah. it, it, it can uh, it can rot away yeah yeah yep it can um it can what's the term i'm looking for it flakes away and starts to be brittle it starts to become brittle and all of a sudden your mm. your cable's exposed so um irish ham radio LMR 400 is great, but really stiff. LMR 400 is fantastic cable for um, the fixed runs outside mm. where you don't need to worry about flexing it. You're running it um, yeah, up the, up the mast, up the tower to the, to the antenna. So um, that's good. 214, RG214, that's interesting cable because usually you hear about 213. RG213 is a common cable that beginners will hear about. 214 is slightly different because it uses, um, well, the good stuff uses two shields. It's two uh, braided shields. They're right. all, al they're all um, uh, <coughs> what do you call it, the same. Uh, there's no aluminium foil or anything like that. Um, and that's the cable that I actually use for repeater jumpers. Um, and there's a reason for that because the uh, if the cables use different metals in the... Um, in the jacket of the shield, so if, if um, in the jacket under the jacket, so if you think of a copper copper braid, but it's got an aluminium foil, sorry, aluminium foil for Americans <laughs> who are listening, aluminium foil. 
you've got two different metals and if they're sitting next to one another that becomes a di- that, beca- that creates a diode effect which sits when those two uh, two bits of sure. um, material sitting to next to each other so what happens is in repeaters you get crackle and you get noise which you probably have heard before so um, RG214 doesn't have that it's got I think it's two aluminium shields two aluminium braids that are sitting right next to each other so you don't have that problem but uh, and it's flexible too but um but yeah good cable good cable that one yeah and if you're confused about what to buy call the vendor and ask them right tell them what you're going to do and you know hopefully the vendor's on the up and up and they're going to guide you in the right direction i'll tell you to buy something expensive but mm-hmm. uh, if you know that's one of the things i always tell people just just call the vendor and ask and talk to them and ask why i would want this one over over the other one um mm-hmm. I've never spoke to the folks at Mezzi and Poloni, so I don't know, but I know the guys at DX Engineering would totally mm. answer that question for you. Yeah. Um, and if you're – so Irish Ham Radio, again, starts talking about if you're starting out with HF, so um, anything – I would say if, for RG58, I would use that on anything below um, probably 14 megahertz. That's probably – perfectly fine for that sort of thing uh, when you start to get up to 21 megahertz and a little bit higher depending on how long your cable run is um, it starts to become a bit lossy but um, definitely for beginning and you can always upgrade it later and I think you mentioned too about spending heaps on the radio but not spending much on the cable I think it's a good investment to invest in the cable and then you sort of what is it what's the what's the old um, the saying Buy once, buy once, buy once, once, cry or, once, that kind of thing. Yeah, buy once, cry once. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But you you also don't need to buy LMR four hundred for every application and and connectors and mm. all that kind of stuff because you can mm. tie a lot of money up there that could be spent in other place. When you take a look at from the from where you're sitting in your seat to the end of your antenna, there's inefficiencies all along the way. Um, you have to look at what's practical, what what is something that's affordable, and what is going to make the biggest change for you when you when you look at that. Mm. Um, there's a lot of guys that run uh, twin line or ladder line, or uh, there's a million million different names for it. But instead of instead of actual coaxial cable, okay. um, you know, I'm not making fun of them, but to me that seems like a huge, tremendous uh, amount of work that mm. I don't necessarily you know, necessarily want to put in. But but uh, yeah. they do it, and it's it's lossless and swear by it. Well, Callum's talking about um, he got 100 meters of LDF 450. LDF 450 is Heliac's hardline, the the big reel, the the thick stuff. And I run meters that on, is a lot. That's like three. That is a very heavy roll of coax. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I run I run that on on VHF um, and above, so two meters and above, um, because yeah, it's it's really really low loss, um, but it is very expensive, and the connectors are very expensive. But if you can afford that. And it's fixed and it's outside. Then, you know that that works well in that application. But uh, as you said, you know, it all depends on what you need. I wouldn't run that thick coax if I was installing in an eighty meter dipole, in your car. like yeah, or or, or ten <laughs> meters away, yeah, or in the car because it's just too thick. It's too impractical. So, right. um, but uh, but yeah, Jason says important question when running cable through buried conduit. How many additional strands of pull tape do you run through the conduit the first time? That's actually a very good question. <laughs> um, I, I thought the actual, uh, I thought that the uh, the the question was going to be related to burying coax. Um, yeah, uh, it is a very good idea to run some some pull string or some some sort of way to pull the, um, additional cables through uh, conduit that's buried because yeah, you don't want to have to go and dig that sucker up and have to replace it. Um, also puts. Well, I think put he's a, asking about pull tape, not even additional strands of coax. Because if your pull oh, tape right. busts, right? If your pull tape busts, then then, then what are you going to oh, do? Yeah, your, yeah, conduit, yeah. your conduit's buried. Your SOL, right? Well, you, I, it depend, I suppose it depends on how much cable you've got coming out the end of the coax, but, uh, out of the end of the conduit, because you could technically use the coax as a pull cable if you're really desperate. But that's probably yeah. not a that's probably not a good idea. But um, well, the they other have thing these, is. Um, is Make sure that you make sure your conduit is thick enough to put multiple cables through later on if you want to do that. Because I've been caught out a few times where the conduit that I've put in has not been thick enough to like put a couple of lengths of two one three through because it's sure. thicker, right? So yeah, just that's a good thing when you're when you're putting that down. 
But you also have these um, fiberglass poles that you can get that you can connect together, multiple ones to make them longer. And uh, they do a really good job of snaking through things. Um, we, we use them at work to run cables and stuff like that through the ceiling and stuff and, and conduit in the building. You, you could easily do that for underground too. Do you use over there uh, the, uh, the floorboard, the tongue floorboard that joins floorboards together? Do you have we that do. over there? Yeah, mm-hmm. so we um we actually have a, our hardware sells that it's like a it's like a thin plastic we call it um yellow tongue because it's yellow and it's flat like a tongue. Sure, um, why wouldn't you? And, yeah, and and <laughs> we use that to it's because it's it's flexible and movable. You can run it up walls and through through mm-hmm. holes and conduits and stuff and round corners to uh, to use as a pull a pull wire a pull string um, to pull the the cable through. So. Um, Wessex weather. I have ten a ten meter run of Ultraflex Seven. Is there much harm in using short RG fifty eight jumpers? Uh, again, it depends on what frequency you're using that on. Um, well, how short for, are we talking? Yeah, and, and if it's for HF, it, it will be fine. And it also depends on too how much power you want to run on on the uh, on what frequency as well. So, um, but for HF, generally the lower HF bands, that's fine. Um, just uh, having a look through it some more. Um, ah, here we go. Mark's just corrected me. Uh, RG two on four is double braided silver braided copper. Sorry, yes, silver. That's the word I was looking for earlier on. Not aluminium. Not aluminium. No, aluminium is bad. That's what I was thinking. Because LMR four hundred, if I'm right, if I'm correct, I think it's either copper clad aluminium braid. And it's a, got a foil, an aluminium foil. Um, yeah, I think there's the, a foil uh, under, underneath the brain. Yeah. yeah, which is just a, the, the, the foil's responsibility is just another layer of screening or shielding, basically. Yeah, it's, it's shielding to stop signals, right? Mm, mm, to stop signals from getting into the cable. Right. Um, uh, just your your neighbor's uh, koi, koi pond pump uh, transmitting interference. <laughs> Are you I still dirty about guy. your neighbor doing that, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. I talked to a guy, and uh, his, his neighbor had a koi pond, and he bought some kind of fountain and some kind of pump for it, and when he installed it, his you know, shack went haywire. Mm. And uh, you know, he approached the guy, and the guy was not responsive about, you know, was, was like, it ain't, it ain't my problem. It works fine. You know, that's you're crazy talking to aliens, you know, all that stuff. And uh, <laughs> They, they they talk through it and he's like, look, you can either get it replaced or I can call, you know, I can report you for interference and all this stuff. And um, the guy ended up getting a different pump and it, and it worked, it went away and it worked fine. But uh, mm. that that's where that shielding's handy is it'll help you out in a situation like that. Mm. Yep. Yeah. A couple of guys have been saying uh, uh, big conduit is the way to go. Yeah, definitely. You can, um, you, you run, especially a straight line of co- of conduit is fine because the coax generally will be run straight through the the uh, the the conduit. But when you start to have bends, so if you're bending up right. and into the shack or something, you got to remember that the cable's bending around. You don't have as much room going around anymore, and then things start to get hard when you're running extra cables in. Well, um, especially when you got- have inflexible cable, right? If you bend it too far and you put it at stress on that cable, that center conductor will start to go through that dielectric and can short out, right? Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. So coax will have a minimum bend radius, um, which mm-hmm. you should, uh, which you should, yeah, not bend the cable um, any, like otherwise you kink it and then, as you say, the, the center conductor starts to creep towards the, the outer a little bit and can, can cause issues. Although I do get quite a bit of, I don't know, you probably cop quite a bit of heat around winding coax around toroids do. for uh, for coax chokes because you uh you the the minimum bend radius is exceeded but well the thing is it's like a lot of people get worked up because i also use rg58 which is a low which is a higher loss cable when i do that and i'm only using a couple feet it to, to do that but it, it's much as we already talked about a much more flexible cable so it has a it has a higher bend radius factor i don't know how you, if you can really measure that but um a lot of times it's when you work the cable back and forth that it that it causes a problem if you you know if you do it once, gently it's not yeah, really gently be a gently bend it yeah, yeah you're, you're going to be okay 
And the thing is, is that the cable's like 11 bucks with the toroid in there wrapped up and everything. You, you know what I mean? Like, if it, if it goes bad, I'm going to replace it. It's not a big Just, deal. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, this is the Hyperflex 5 from Messi and Poloni. And compared to RG58, this this is, you know, this is a lot more flexible. Like, look at that. That's not kinking at all. Um, the bend yeah, I'd like to see that uh, tested from the one choke. There we go. Yeah, uh, no. So this is the this is the actual. I've actually got this cable on the on the choke at the moment. Um, oh, it cool. works really well. Yeah, um, I can't remember how many turns it's on. It's on my six meter antenna. I've got, I think it's four and four on a two forty, FT two forty. I think it's about eight. So, um, so yeah. Looks like we're past Callum's bedtime. He's going to go get his glass of milk. Uh, See you, bud. Night, Callum. Thank you for uh, for for joining in. FEP, Jim. What are your thoughts on RG three one six for jumpers between tuners and radios? That kind of thing. Is three one three one six is the thin stuff, isn't it? Is three one six the super thin. Yeah, stuff, I always get I always get I get them mixed up, but it's um yeah, it's it's pretty thin stuff. Mm. And the power handling the the problems. The problems you have with 316 is the power handling capabilities of it. Um, I noticed that you put about between tuners and the radio, so not, not an amplifier and a radio. Um, but uh, if it's a, like a short jumper that's only like 30 centimetres long, then... Yeah, you're you know, generally okay. Yeah, like a foot long, then it's not really a problem. I cannot um, remember who I... I, I have this, um, this cable here. I can't remember who I ordered it from. And it's like thirty-five feet. I want to say it's three sixteen, but it might be. It might. It could not be the. Be. It could be one seven. One seventy-four four is normally black. It has a black jacket on it. What's the other one? Not one seven four. There's another one that's um that's similar to that. Um, one four two. I got this from Pac Ten. I think. Looks similar as well. I think. And um, let me go to. Pack ten a shop, and I'll tell you what. The good, it is. the good thing that RG three one six is for, because just show that cable again. It is, uh, uh, it is three sixteen. Yeah, just thirty five feet that, to three sixteen. Just show that that cable. Can you show how thin that is? So that's yeah. I mean, like that's the that's the cable right there. Um, that's super I don't know thin how, how big you, how big y'all's pens are down there, but that's it next to an American pen. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think pens are about the same size, but uh, uh, let's yeah, not com- let's n- let's not compare pens on stream, right? Um, <laughs> right. But uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, the the that cable is good for soda, or if you're hanging up a dipole from like a um, yep. squid pole. That's exactly what like I got that. it for. for um, so mm. I use my um, 705 a lot, and this is what I would use with my 705, either this or 174, because I'd want some kind of you know quality light. Uh, cable that I that I could use. Mm, mm. Max says one thing I'm struggling with is finding cables with connectors already attached. Would it be worthwhile learning to crimp coax connectors myself this early? I think crimp is the right term. Yep, that's the correct term. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can terminate coaxial cables. You can some some are solder, some are crimp, some are clamp, um, compression clamp, um, solder. crimp, solder. That's another word that I say incorrectly, apparently. Um, but generally, I don't know. I prefer crimp connectors if they're not being flexed all the time. So um, let me if I can disconnect my this and show you here. So this is this is a jump. This is just an RG58 jumper cable that I've got in the shack. That's a crimp one. So you can see there that 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 does get disconnected and reconnected a bit. Um, but the moisture can get in there too, right? Yeah, well, not in the shack, but um, outside you usually will weatherproof this with some um, uh, tape, amalgamation tape, or I don't know what you call it over there. We call it amalgamating tape. We would call it um, amalgamating tape, or the other thing that you would tape. use is something like this liquid tape maybe. Yeah, just to keep the moisture out. Um, or um, I w- I'd probably heat shrink that though. Yeah, heat shrink as well. Um, glue lined heat shrink with with these connectors if I can get it to focus um, the issue is is that as the cable flexes in here you'll start to see braid and you'll start to see the coax will start to creep out of the, the crimp because this is not right. this is not like um, 
squishing the cable as such. This is just holding that, that braid in there. So um, I prefer crimp connectors as long as you're not flexing them all the time. If you are flexing them all the time, then probably something like a compression clamp is a little bit better because it holds that, um, holds that in a little bit easier. The Messi and Poloni, um, I, I, never used to, I never used to prefer compression cl um, clamps at all. Um, until I saw the Messi and Poloni ones, and they're just um, amazing what they do with their cables. Well, you'll go broke on a good set of coax crimps. You know, it's like um, everybody's like, oh, I don't want to use the Anderson Power Pole crimper, so I'm just going to use my needle nose pliers. And they ultimately always have a problem. Uh, yep. If you are going to embark on making your own cables, I would say get a reasonably good quality set of, uh, of, of crimps and all the, all the appropriate tools that you need for the mm -hmm. size cable that you're planning on working with. Um, yeah. And it's expensive a, up front. Right? Yeah, but if you get a crimp tool that you've got removable dies, you can actually get the dies for different size cables to put in there. Yes. So you can yes. use the same tool. Um, um, the thing is, is like in the beginning, you'll say to yourself, "Well, hey, I can just buy the cable, and it's going to cost me a couple of dollars more to pay for the for the for the connectors on the end of it." Yeah. Um, but when you go back and you look at the first ten years of being a ham and all the different times you had to run cable and buy cable and do. You would have saved money in the long run by by buying the thing. The other one is is that it sometimes you got to put that cable through a, through a, through a tight spot, and if you've got a big mm -hmm. old connector on the end of there, it's not going to work, and you're going to have to cut it off, run it, and then and then uh, crimp it again. The um, yeah, that, that's that's entirely correct, and I think that uh, you, you'd have a video on your channel about crimping coax connectors somewhere i'm sure i, I, I don't actually don't have one on coax oh, connectors there we go. i've got all Looks kinds like... of crimping but i don't have coax the cal posted in the chat earlier that apparently he doesn't know how to crimp crimping is one of the more controversial things in uh electronics amateur radio like when when you no matter how you do it somebody's going to come in there and be like you a smacked ass boy that ain't the yeah. way that you crimped that wire you did it all you know it doesn't matter how you do it it just brings yeah. them right out of the woodwork Yep, yep. Maybe I need to do a video on uh, on crimping when I can get them all. Yeah, that's right, on crimping coaxial cables. But one thing that we will point out, whenever you put, especially, so this is a PL259 connector, and obviously we're talking about coax today, not connectors. But if the best piece of advice is this ferrule, which attaches the screws on to the connector, make sure you put this over the coax <laughs> first before you terminate it. How many people have done it? They've gone and they've terminated the cable and they've forgotten to put this on. And it's well, the terminator would be like, that looks good, right? I took my time. Yeah, yeah. It looks good. <laughs> then, it's always, it's the one that you've spent the most amount of time on and then you realize, <laughs> oh, whoops, I forgot to put that on. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that there's plenty of people that have had that same issue. But, um, but yes, learn how to crimp and maybe I need to do a video on it. Um, uh, just going back through some more questions here because I know that they're coming in. Uh, Patrick mentions about watching the video on MMP connectors, soldering iron, knife, two wrenches. Yeah, you only need a couple of tools. They're very easy to put together. Yeah, I don't know much about their connectors. I can probably have to look into that. Always um, always invest a lot in your tools as well, so get decent tools. Uh, like as Ape said, you don't want to be using your needle nose pliers or your crimpers to crimp down um power you know automotive connectors or anything like that you want to get some decent crimpers that are for the job well like even like a bad crimp job can can be a total hassle right and what you're trying to trying to do um it can cause bad poor connectivity it can introduce interference just it, it's it's so worth it to do it right mm. yep for sure um Patrick says one of those 316 or one of the others has an astounding power rating. So that must be for the size of the of yeah. the cable. Um, I think that's what TO's running. Um, mm. And, you know, I talked to a guy when I first got into ham radio, this, this guy was complaining about RG8X and saying that he was burning it up um, with his amp. He's running full legal limit, which is 1,500 watts. And uh, he kept saying he was burning the cable up and it was going bad. And I was like, this guy's crazy. What is he talking about? But the thing is, is also RG8X is not the same. Like you got your quality RG8X and then you've got your eBay RG8X, which is probably just relabeled RG58. But um, it's it's a good idea to buy your connectors 
and your wire from a reputable dealer. Mm. Yeah, Nathan's talking about compression connectors being the best. Yeah, a bit of soldering, a bit of spandering, all good. It, it takes a little bit of time to um, to perfect the art of putting connectors on coax. Um, I, I'm sure that you're the same. You you find your own way of doing it. It might not necessarily be someone else's way of doing it, but if it's you know if if you um, you know putting it on properly, yeah. then it's not really a problem. I know that. Uh, uh, some people don't like to when they put the connectors on when they're crimping. They don't like to trim back the braid. They like to just put the the crimp connector right. on and just crimp it, and then they leave the braid there, and then they put maybe heat shrink over it just to make it look good. Uh, that's fine. You can leave the the braid on like it's not going to be a problem. But um, you know, other people might not do that. So <laughs> ham like me is totally right. He says it just takes one little tiny strand of shield wire. <laughs> to get uh, get all boogered up in there, and then you're done. You're done for. That's actually a, a very good point. Using a multimeter to test test continuity between yeah. the center and the, the center of the coax and the braid of the coax. Um, you always want to make sure that you test at one end the center to the to the braid, and then you also want to test from each end the center to center and the braid to braid to make sure you get that continuity going on with the multimeter. Um, yeah, I've, I've got sure, a video show. I'm pretty sure you've do done that. a video on that. Yeah, <laughs> and and the thing is, is that people go nuts in there. They're like that's not how you test for continuity. I'm like, oh, okay. And then <clears throat> I've gotten a comment where like, what if one end's terminated up on the roof of my house? My multimeter cable doesn't go that far. Mm. And I'm like, go short it out and see if you have continuity, and then unshort it. But yeah. it, I'm, you know, I'm not going to climb up on the roof and do all that stuff. That's crazy talk. But mm. um, people just get upset sometimes quick. Mm. Uh, Patrick is talking uh, in the in the chat about water sealing. Yes, yeah, so self, the difference with self amalgamating tape is that it binds onto itself, and then ve eventually it um, molds itself into one you know like giant blob basically over the cable, so that water can't actually get in. If you use electrical tape uh, over a connector, it doesn't matter how many times you go back and forth over it there's still little gaps where the water can seep in underneath the electrical um, electrical tape and it's it won't be a um, it won't be a good seal so bill probably the best advice for the entire stream is buy once cry once which we mentioned earlier on as well well some people talk about their electrical tape and how they wrap it and they're like i wrap it in a reverse corkscrew pattern so that way the water runs that you know and i'm like i, I don't you lost me there on the reverse corkscrew but hmm. nathan's but talking too about the the mmp scissors so you, I know you haven't seen those, um, but I know that when I've used a knife before to peel away the outer jacket of the cable, I'm always um, nicking you the braid the, or right, cutting, right. and the braid just falls to pieces. And then you're like, "Oh, I got to start again." And, and then you get it in your eye. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no, you, you, you do have to be careful there. But yeah. um, I don't have the Messi and Poloni scissors, but I've got a pair of, of cable scissors. And uh, those things are sh sharp that I make sure that, I, you know, I put them away when I'm done using them so I don't accidentally cut myself. Yep. Um, T-Ray was saying that when you have that one little piece of shield run across there, a lot of people, he says, hit it with 12 volts to burn it, to burn it out. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because I was joking around about a shorted wire with um, Jim at FEP Labs Radio, and he said, he said the same thing. He said back in the telco days, people would, you know, run a bunch of voltage down the line to, to, to burn all the shorts. Yeah. Um, just uh, talking about uh, the uh, cutting through cutting through the cable. Um, I I know I have before. You get, you get a bit of a sense of how much pressure you have to put on. And I've had times where I've had to terminate cable, and I haven't had a knife, so I've used things like side cutters, which are <laughs> terrible to use. But you use the side cutters, and you can you can actually feel because you start to cut. And you can feel the plastic feel, and then you can feel this. Oh, there's the braid, and then you peel it off, and you know if you're careful, you can still do it. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend using side cutters for for a new new person who's uh, trying to terminate coaxial cables. Yeah, well, they they have these. You can buy like these co coaxial cable cutters that have a sizing chart in there for the right size of cable that you're using, and when you put it on, you, you it just kind of grips on there, and you just twist it. And then the, you can cut the jacket off, or you can cut the the sleeve off, and then or you can cut the you cut the braid, or even go all the way down to the to the center conductor. Mm. 
That's why it's such a good idea to have the appropriate tools for the job that you're trying to. Mm. Uh, Dave, we, amalgamating tape for water protection exactly and uh, electrical tape can then go over the top of the amalgamating tape which is correct um, to avoid the UV because amalgamating tape generally isn't uh, UV right. stable or UV proof. So um, electrical tape will will uh, will be your UV protection so that the, the amalgamating tape doesn't become brittle and break up over time especially. I don't know what your sun is like over there in the UV, but we have extreme UV down here. And um, Our sun is a yellow sun. Is it? Um, <laughs> no, but we, you know, <laughs> you, you, UV will get you anywhere. It's it will, even if it's cloudy. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a good point to try and protect from that. So, um, but yeah, if you if you're in an area where you get high UV, then uh, definitely it's uh, it, it's a problem with cable. Oh, here it is. I've got actually got it sitting right next to me. I, I don't know how you is it butyl butyl rubber tape. This is the stuff. Yeah, I've use. got I've got some of it around here somewhere. It's kind of goofy the tape. But um, the other one is is a good electrical tape because you know you can get your. You get your gas station electrical tape where you can get, you know, good electrical tape that is UV protected and um, is, there's mm. a difference there. Yeah, uh, the the brand we use is Nitto. They're the, see, Brent. They're, they're the good, um, they're the good um, electrical tape here. But, 3M, yeah, you're I think, right. is, is it? Yeah. yeah, 3M, 3M as well. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff. Um and Zana, Zona EA Radiofication says that Nido tape is amazing. Yeah. Oh, hello. Look who's. Uh, <laughs> crikey. Crikey. Look, look, at, look at. No, Crikey's Australian. Look who's uh, just popped in. So. Um, I see. I see that. <laughs> come back. How you doing, man? Uh, yeah. So basically, um, the best coax for ham radio beginners, I think, is first of all. You got to look at your budget. Your budget's probably the the main thing. If you can spend that little bit more for the for the better cable, then definitely do it. If you're using RG58, only use it on sort of the lower HF bands. When you start to get to a bit higher than that, use RG213 or RG8X. Um, if you've got a little bit more money and you really want to spend once cry once, have a look at the Messi and Poloni stuff because that's the that's the uh, the high quality stuff there, and then you start to get towards the hard line for the top end of VHF and UHF. So um, that's probably the that's probably the stuff that uh, that you want to be looking at. Look at that just jumps in with a smart smart Alec comment and <laughs> pops out. So. Well, the Messi Apollonia it comes with like a pretty good stat sheet here, the mm. test and measurement reports and graphs and charts and all this stuff telling you how wonderful it is. That makes me wonder if they tested my individual piece. <laughs> well, um, and uh, the the putting putting the connectors together because I think it was Max who was in the chat earlier. Um, they actually show here that there's a video on the QR code there, but they show all the steps on what you need to do and the measurements and everything that you need to do to actually cut the cable. So it looks um, like a lot of work. That. No, well, see, no, it looks like a lot of work, but it's actually not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's actually not. It's actually pretty easy. It's, it's rewarding work. But they've got all this insertion loss information. and Have a look, yeah. at, have a look at their website. If you haven't um, seen their cables before, then I'll just put a link in the chat somehow. Um, have a look because it's, uh, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, but, yeah, coax is... Coax can be a, um, a interesting thing, like it can be something that can be, like don't don't overthink it. Basically, just you know get what you can and and start from there. Yeah, it, but they, again, try. You know, I'm, I'm not saying don't buy cheaper or affordable stuff, but don't buy junk. I guess is the is the thing. Yeah, I'd be very dubious buying coax off of Amazon or um, eBay, um, unless you've got a lot of. Um, uh, disposable income that you don't care too much about, which none of us do as hams. Um, but uh, but yeah, the 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 cable that you get from some of the ham retailers like um, DX Engineering, Gigaparts, um, Benelec, Messi and Poloni, all those places, um, they will have you know decent cable that's been used for years. Yeah, and and the thing is, is that they get actual real customer feedback. 
Mm-hmm. So that, that's why I say you give them a call and talk to them, and they'll tell you, oh, well, I know that this one's popular for this particular use. And th- those, those places have a vested interest in you being a return customer. I'm not mm-hmm. so sure the guy on eBay does. Yeah, yep, yep. And a, a lot of those, um, a lot of those uh, connectors on pre-made cables as well, are also uh, are also junk too. Like they, yeah, they'll they'll come apart, or the um, the uh, BNC, the center pin will come out, and you know all that sort of stuff. And I've had those fall <clears> apart <throat> before. Yeah, I had a barrel connector, cheap barrel connector break. It's something and it broke internally, and you know, not not getting any, not hearing anything, not getting out. And I'm wondering what the heck's going on. I go outside and look at my antenna and I check all my coax out in the yard to see if something happened to it. And, uh, you know, check everything. The last thing I checked was that barrel connector. I just was sitting there and I was like, well, maybe the barrel connector is bad. I unscrewed it, put another one in. If you have a connector that you suspect is bad, we're in the trash. Throw it out. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you'll be like, oh, I'll set it here so I know where it is. You'll mess up and we put it back in line somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I just found another piece of that uh, thin thin uh thin cable too and notice too it doesn't have the uh the the black outer jacket this is like a clear yeah um, clear jacket as well so you can actually see inside it so this stuff as well um i'm a bit dubious as whether that actually lasts out in the sun in the uv sun yeah. too. so if you do um install 316 outside like I'm, i've got um some some of this cable on on balance and things outside uh, you probably want to wrap it in some tape or put it in a box or something just to save it from the sun because otherwise it'll it'll go brittle and break up. What was that? Your fancy pants uh, SDR? No, no. This is a um, this is actually a a reference clock. Um, oh, cool. This is actually the re- this is the reference clock from Leo Bodner for the ni- IC ninety seven hundred. Cool. So this outputs a this takes a GPS input and outputs a frequency to frequency lock so do you, do you have to power that thing it's a it's a it's a it's powered off five volts off of um off of usb yeah see look at that yeah so um so i plug that into the back of my 9700 and it uh, gps locks it so but i've done a video on that yeah you sure have before. <laughs> nathan asks, what is sun asking from the uk <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense it's uh it's quite nice actually outside today i don't know why i'm inside streaming it's like 25 degrees and nice so um so yeah uh good discussion um on the uh, on the best yeah. coax so uh, if you have any more questions leave them in the comments below and uh we'll try to um to help you out with it uh we've already learned that we need to make a video on crimping coax cables so that might be the next thing that we're going to be doing <laughs> right um so thanks for joining me today Ape. it's always good to have you anytime on. man thanks and um and check out the smoking apes uh YouTube channel. Um, Number one. It's the most electrifying ham radio channel on YouTube. (laughs) Oh, I enjoy it. I don't know about others, but I enjoy it. Uh, Thanks to everybody in the chat, too. Uh, Great questions today. And um, everyone's, uh, you know, got uh, different opinions on the cable that they use, but at the end of the day, just use what works for you and uh, you'll have no problems. So Awesome. Jim's make Jim's having he's causing troubles, isn't he? In the, he's getting in a little chat. fresh mouth. He's getting fresh yeah. mouth over there. Yeah, he is. All right, seventy three all. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll see you in the next stream. <laughs> Take care.